I think it's been uh, very, very uh, interesting to understand, you know, uh, how continuously this government and uh, is actually doing, uh, continues to do a lot of changes in policies as things change. Um, you know, I think you reaffirmed the fact that there is definitely excellent growth from now uh, up to 2023, uh, which is, uh, I, I'm sure, very interesting to hear. Uh, thanks for sharing the various new policies that the government, and especially the financial <coughs> trade agreements, you know, that the government is, uh, is signing continuously. Uh, we have a lot of China, and uh, I'm sure you know, that's going to help. Um, Thanks for sharing about the new investments that the government is making, you know, in, in the specific areas, which is uh, very encouraging to most of us uh, in, in the trade that we belong to. And uh, I think the very interesting point that you raised was with respect to small and medium enterprise focus. Uh, it's, it's actually a fact that as uh, transactional economy improves, as transaction sites become smaller, and the internet brings all of us together and makes connections easily and, and more possible, you will find the growth of small and medium enterprises actually uh, uh, coming up. And that's going to be a major reform that will happen all across global economy. Small and medium enterprises are going to play a very, very vital role and therefore it becomes important for, for these uh, uh, enterprises to actually embark on technology, to move on uh, improving overall skills with the organization and to look at their strategy from a global perspective or, or from a large region perspective. Uh, and this is a very interesting point that's being made. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with this, uh, with, the, with the end of the keynote, we move to the first session of uh, the conference, which is uh, the panel discussion. Uh, the panel discussion topic is assessing the warehousing demand and opportunities in the MENA region. Uh, for this uh, panel discussion, I would like to invite uh, Mr. James Lynch. He's the Associate Director, Commercial Agencies and Investment, Sabir. James Lynch is the Head of Industry, Industrial uh, Agencies and Logistics, Sabir. He's an uh, exceedingly experienced and qualified chartered surveyor with over 10 years of experience uh, in agency valuation and asset management work in both UK and the UAE, Mr. James Lynch. Our second panelist is Mr. Federico Ruiz. Uh, he's from Walmart uh, Industries. Federico uh, is an industrial engineer with a master's degree in automation, an automotive industry, and an executive MBA in ISAD Business School. He works as a supply chain manager with MENA region at Walmart Industries, the world leaders in precision irrigation segment. As I call your name, please come and take your seat. I now next call upon Mr. Jamal Razik. Uh, he is the Chief Operating Officer, HSC 24. Uh, Jamal is a senior executive with vast experience of managing complex omni channels and digital supply chain and logistics operations in multiple, multiple countries up to the regional director. He is an expert in retail, e-commerce, and wholesale, both B2B and B2C. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Ajit Barreto. Ajit uh, Barreto is the sales, cargo, and logistics uh, head uh, with Air International. He's been in the UAE for uh, the past eight years, where he has uh, ushered the improvement of processes for warehousing, removals, sea freight, and air freight. His experience and interest lies in setting operational standards for logistics flows and warehouse. Ajit. Our next panelist is Mr. Sian Bramli, who is the Managing Director, Freightworks, Sian. Mr. Sian is an established HR professional with a focus on developing women in logistics. I got two. That should be enough. Yes, we need more. 
He's one of the one of the very few logistics experts with significant real-time executive management experience within the integrator, uh, freight, postal, and supply chain sector across four continents, and has demonstrated successful business growth. Gentlemen, welcome to the panel. So I'm going to ask a few questions, you know, uh, on behalf of the delegates uh, on this particular topic, so that we can see what what exactly you know happening uh, in not only in Dubai but also in the region. Here, uh, I'm sure most of the insights that will be provided by you will be of great help, you know, to uh, the delegates out here. So James, if I was to start uh, with you. Uh, as an active industrial agent uh, in the market, how would you, you know, describe the current market condition? Basically, you know, comparing supply to one. Yeah, sure, fine. Um, yeah, ultimately we are in a challenging um, industrial market at the minute. We've seen a softening of conditions over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, but that doesn't mean that there, there, isn't, there isn't activity. Um, in 2018, we received approximately 2 million square feet of, uh, of inquiries, and we transacted on about 600,000 square feet of industrial uh, lending and sales. So we still have a very active market, but um, I think what we also see is a, a market correction, or an ongoing correction, um, and that ultimately reflects the mismatch, or perhaps current mismatch, in some of the supply demand dynamics. Um, in certain sectors, in certain locations, we have oversupply, um, and in, in certain sectors, in certain locations, we have an under demand, and ultimately that put pressure on rents and put pressure on rental values. Great. Uh, so that means you do see, you know, you, you do see a particular transforming demand. I mean, if there is a change in demand, what type of change? Yeah. So I think I think just to expand on demand a little bit, there's a probably two tier demand. Um, good quality, uh, well-specified warehouses are still in demand, and, and we still see activity and interest in those units. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, uh, maybe the older, dated, um, 20, 30-year-old warehouses, perhaps there's, a, there's certainly a, a, a drop-off in demand in those, and uh, relatively that means there's a drop-off in pricing on those. I think I think that that divergence of primary and secondary assets is probably going to continue. Um, over, over the next 12 to 24 months. Okay, that's, that's I think, very interesting, uh, the point you brought up. Uh, now, I, I come from there to uh, Federico. Yeah. Uh, Federico, uh, can you share some of these transformations that you see that are taking place in the country? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, for speaking about the, the demand and the transformation that we are facing here in, in MENA and in my region, that is uh, EMEA, uh, we have to think that this region uh, has a, a very specific theme and it's growth. So you have to keep this word in mind to face all the operations and to understand what is happening outside. So growth means that we are normally used to face projects in our case of 100 machines. And the last one that I got is 1,000 machines. So how can I face this? There are two options here. And what I'm seeing about the transformation is that in one side, we are demanding more warehouse with ultimate uh, industries, technologies, uh, industry 4.0, and Kanban automated, and these kind of things. But on the other hand, to face this growth, you need to simplify your operations. And simplify means that sometimes you need just a space, a warehouse, with limited capabilities of operations. Means loading and unloading with a free space that lets you lets you grow so well. And it, yeah, it's, uh, it's very flexible for you as well. So uh, I agree with, uh, with you when you say that uh, there are two, like, two tendencies. First of all, is the industry automation. The other one is just to go simplify and just have a space with limit operations. Okay, so I think your perspective is with respect to the industry that you uh, belong to. And uh, you're saying that simplification is the order of the day, you know, um, in order to be able to meet the, the kind of demands that you have to put up on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you grow, you have to be depending on many things and you have many inputs that you have to get your insights. 
if you are constantly depending on your uh, on your inside, inside of the company, inside of the operations, you will never see what is happening outside. So for facing this reality, what is happening outside, you have to be with the customer and you have to simplify the operations as much as possible. In our case, we are delivering machines that is irrigation machines. These machines is like oil and gas, so consists in many pipes put together over the field, 60 meters span, and then a tower with wheels that turns around and can irrigate fields and fields and kilometers and hectares of, uh, of any kind of harvest or crop. So we are putting this into 40 feet container, so one machine is one, feet, one 40 feet container more or less, and we need, uh, for the warehouse, our demand is to have something a stock for facing this huge project. So I will, I will be, I, I will take care about how to perform my inventory. What I need is just a space, and I will tell you when to unload, where to unload, upload, sorry, and then you will take care of this. However, in my core competencies in the technology, because this machine has a lot of technology and the panels you can you can control by by, by of course uh, the cell phone, the iPad, or whatever, and we are applying now machine learning. So there are some components, some technological components that I want to deliver and add some value on this. These ones are controlled by a um, more intelligent warehouse. So these are the two. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll come to you. Uh, you have the operations of HSC24, and I'm sure you all, for you, every transaction is a, a customer. And the number of transactions are growing by the way that you're reading about the company. Uh, which means that it puts a lot of pressure in terms of the overall productivity of operations in the warehouse. Uh, what type of efficiencies, you know, you probably are monitoring a lot of efficiencies to see how you can become more and more efficient, and probably at the end of the day, create a delightful customer experience, okay? So, keeping all this in the background, uh, what are, uh, in your opinion, are the emerging models, you know, uh, to share with the delegates out here, you know, in warehouses? What are these changing models as we keep saying, we heard it, 30, 40 year old warehouses from one of uh, panelists out there. Uh, we heard about, you know, there are boxes which look nice from outside, but probably are not so efficient from inside. Uh, so in your opinion, and the type of business that you um, head, uh, what do you see the changing models of warehouses? Um, yeah, so uh, on the retail business and on the channel business that we, we face <coughs> on the e-commerce, we have to see the transformation. So when I came 15 years ago, uh, we used to have many brands in these big companies, and we used to distribute these brands. And the principal come to, used to come to us and tell us, I want to secure the stock. I would like to have between three to six months stock in my warehouse if you want to distribute my product. So we used to have a need for a huge uh, 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 demand of warehouse space. And this is the way it used to be. And when we used to have three months stock, uh, we, were, we were not happy and we were not looking at the other cost. Today what's happening is that we are facing a massive transformation. The customer look at the retail product and he looks at it with the price, with the shipping, which is how much it costs if I buy it from UE, or how much it costs if I buy it from China, or how much it costs if I buy it from London. And this is uh, what we call the drop shipping. And the main change that we are facing right now in, uh, in the, the warehouse industry is how much space shall we keep? If even the principals comes to us and tell us, I'm not going to leave your warehouse, I'm, going, I'm just going to leave your warehouse for the fast moving goods which are close to the customer. And for the rest, I'm going to, I'm going to deliver your retail product directly from my warehouse in Germany to your customer directly. So how do we transform that? How do we do that? And it's happening already with some brands. Um, the main target in the retail business is to be closest to the customer. As fast as we can. This put in question the, uh, the idea and uh, even the, the concept of free zone. Because if we are in a free zone, we can't sell to the mainland. And one of the main questions that we are asking to the government is, can we sell directly from the free zone? This is one thing that we want to uh, uh, see as a transformation. The second thing is how can we close to the customer by not having massive warehouses, but one big, uh, one big warehouse 
hundreds of thousands of square meters, fifty thousand square meters, and we still have enough heating. But house, very small the houses which are surrounded by the main cities in the regions to be able to distribute into these hubs and to be able to, to have our fastest to the good next to the customer. Basically, we call it delivering on the last miles, but I will call it the customer service, <coughs> how we can deliver in two hours. Okay, so we need not massive warehouses, but very small warehouses around the cities across the region. So are you facing any challenges? So you've established the requirement, okay? Uh, the three order requirement. So do you face challenge in actually getting such warehouses? Yes, we face challenges. <coughs> so I, is the challenge the availability of such warehouses, or is the challenge that it is available, but these warehouses are not apt for your kind of operation? <coughs> um, if you look at a city like Riyadh, these warehouses are available. But they are not located where the customer is. They are located in industrial zones. So to cross Riyadh takes sometimes one, two, three, four hours. And the second thing is that the type of warehouse that they are proposing are very traditional without body docks, um, without, without proper equipment, without uh, the IT system which is there, without the automation of the robotics which is there. So this is a bit of both. So the transformation is happening right now. And um, many uh, companies, um, because of that, have decided to go by their own rather than to third <coughs> parties to be able to move faster uh, on these ones. So I completely agree when we talk about the small uh, uh, and medium company developments because this is where I believe from the e commerce or the China retail sector, where is the future. So if you specify your requirement, I'm, I'm focusing on you your customer. So, uh, if you focus, if you if you establish your requirements, okay, and you float these requirements in terms of building infrastructure, the number of docks that you need, the height, length, etc., and also uh, list out your requirements with respect to your operational requirements, don't you see that there are uh, or companies in the market, you know, call it contract logistics organizations or third-party logistics companies that can probably fulfill all these requirements of yours? They are. There are, but there are very few. Oh, so the problem is that there are few. There are few. Uh, if you look, for example, at, um, let's say, the <coughs> big one, most of the time they come with the big solutions and they are quite expensive. And what has happened in the region is that we have created a legacy of IT infrastructure, which is very difficult to plug in in, in, the, in, in this company. So, um, to be able to go, we need to convince, we need to convince that uh, on the transformation that we need to change the entire system sometimes. So, and the entire uh, supply chain network. So they are, which are there. One thing that we face is that around the world there are a lot, and they come a lot to, to this kind of meeting, uh, congress, and, and, but they don't have, they are not established here. And, uh, and, uh, and because they are very few, and because they are not established, from a post customer point of view, we are quite um, hesitant to sign with this company because they don't have offices in the GCC. Because we have faced in the past so many contracts where the customer, the, these companies came in with a contract, okay, and they are uh, in Europe or in US or in China, and suddenly disappear or reduce their support. So one of the requirements of the change for the logistics warehousing is that the companies establish here. So I'm sure there are some third party logistics service providers sitting out here. There's a clue here that he says, use the word few, which means that there are not many companies that he feels are available, you know, of that size who would be able to service him. Uh, then he talked about experience, you know, not many who've got the experience to handle the type of transactions that you look at. And the IT competency. I am a little, you know, baffled at this point, that, you know, in this world of IT and you know, millions of solutions, I'm sure there are hundreds of solutions sitting out here where you can easily integrate you know, one software with the other, uh, your application can talk to the other and, and, and so forth. Uh, and you still face the challenge uh, like this. Let me just take the same question uh, you know, ahead to Ajit. You are a service provider and uh, you are also in terms of freight forwarding, contract logistics, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. Do you, uh, do you have a response uh, to what you now said? Hi guys, good morning. Uh, well, the 
challenge with uh, third party logistics is always to be simple and to provide simple solutions to customers. It's very important to listen to customer demands and accordingly tailor a solution. So sometimes the <coughs> best of IT solutions may not be looked for by the customer, but maybe he looks at a simple warehouse where he needs place to unstuck his cargo, to store it, and to have it delivered just in time without going into the jargons of normal warehousing KPIs, where people demand that you want a one day notice to pick stock and keep it ready for the delivery and stuff like that. Because today in warehousing, customers get orders just in time, we need to be ready for those. What we look at, solutions may not be solutions that customers feel they will find options to give up to their customers. So it's very important to listen, understand, and accordingly take a solution. Uh, I will just come to that. You know, uh, I have an opinion here. You know. uh, the fact is that I think life is no more so simple. We have been hearing this simplicity word a lot. And if we talk about true simplicity, most of us will go out of business because we are here to deal with complexity. Uh, the, the overall supply chain is becoming quite complex. Specifically because now the election volumes you know, are increasing, uh, the size of transactions are becoming smaller, fine, and therefore the numbers you know, are going up. So complexity, I think, is something which is now given, in my opinion. And what I'm hearing from him is the fact that you know it's not that simple. And if if he doesn't find, and I'm looking to him as a customer, you know, if he doesn't find a specialist who can actually solve <coughs> the problem that he or the challenge that he otherwise is facing, uh, then he will have no other option but to keep doing it himself. You know, and in the time that customers keep doing it themselves they will face challenge of uh, scalability and flexibility, which is what it points out. You know, if we do not, as a third party logistics companies, QTLs, contract logistics, warehouse operators, I think the one big thing that we get on the table, you know, is the aspect of flexibility, one, B, scalability, C, specialized operational knowledge. You know, I think these are the three things would, would make a very big difference to companies like that. I'll give a concrete example. If you look at, um, from, from the sector I'm working for, which is mainly the retail and the e-commerce industry, uh, we look at the total solution. We don't look like before at uh, rent or warehouse or last mile, because it's the only chain. If you look at UAE, we have a lot of offer in warehousing, and we have 130 companies who make last mile. If you look at Saudi, we have so many warehouse companies who do warehousing. We have nine companies who do last miles in the entire country in Saudi. Only nine. And if we look from the nine, only three are able to do it well. Okay. Well, I think uh, let's move ahead uh, to Sane Bradley. Um, Sean, tell me one, uh, one thing. You, know, you basically, what I see, from what is written out here is that you know you manage very large groups of human resources, uh, and uh, women are your uh, favorites. Okay, uh, you specialize. Uh, what do you see, you know, that's actually happening, you know, in in this third party or warehouse management space, you know, that's happening quite differently, and you feel you know, very interesting, and you know makes sense for organizations to start building up. Uh, to improve their capacity and capability to operate. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, well, HR has always been a, a very strong point of mine, but uh, over working with various different organisations from uh, Siemens, DHL, GNT, through to smaller companies like Barlow, World, GAC, uh, and now with Freightworks, which is um, it has a global reach, but is relatively a homegrown business, which is about 40 years old. Started by the same guy that started Emirates Airlines, uh, Morris, Morris Flanagan. So when it comes to HR and, and women in logistics, firstly, 
Um, there have been various attempts over the years to, to get more and more females involved in our industry. And I think some companies are doing much better than others in, in that space. Uh, we actually measure the number of female employees we have uh, above warehouse grade. Very difficult to get uh, you know, ladies to work in the warehouse, as, as we can all understand. But once we move outside of that grade, we use the hay grading system, if you're aware of that, we're looking at grades four and above. Um, and we are at 48% uh, now uh, within our company of female staff um, in that space. So in the future, it would be great um, to see 30, 40% of these seats filled by females, I think. Um, not only because they add a lot of flavor, but they also come with fresh ideas. And in some cases, uh, ladies are a lot more diligent than, than guys are. Um, moving on to the, the question about third party logistics, uh, 4PL, 5PL, as people are talking about now, specifically in the e-com space. Um, I was uh, present in the e-com uh, conference uh, last week, which was also very well attended and, and very well run. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of a mix, let's say, in the complexity of what is required in the marketplace. Um, a lot of people still require just that simple shell of a warehouse, whereas uh, you've got your e-com guys now coming in with the last mile requirement, which we have purposely stayed out of. Um, and the reason why we've stayed out of is, I think you mentioned uh, 100 and something people that are trying to take that last mile business. And for us, we see it as a bit of a bloodbath, actually. There will be a, a filtering out uh, rapidly over the next few years of those last mile companies. They'll either be bought, go bust. It, it is an impossibility to actually do what is required by the customer. That it, you can, you, there are many, many years of analysis on B2B, B2C, undertaken by La Post Geopost, of which I was part of, uh, 17 or so in this room would be aware of some of that. Uh, DHL have done the same, DPD have done the same. Huge amounts of money have been spent on how can we make it profitable? And they all backed off and, and didn't go into that space because you can't deliver to a residential area as you can to a CBD. Okay, so you have one driver going, you know he's got 30, 40, 50 deliveries that day. One driver cost, one kilometer petrol cost. You don't get that in a residential area. You've got uh, limits on regulation and uh, legal acceptance of having brown fields near residential areas. Uh, we had a good presentation last week with reference to box pickup. Uh, uh, spaces where people will have all of their deliveries put into boxes automatically the, the uh, one-time pin is sent to your phone you then go to the box pick it up you have a security issue there very simply from my point of view especially in this in, in this region so when you move from uh, your standard warehousing offering price cost benefit go through the three pl to the four pl to the five pl by the time you get to do the sums, there's no money available in terms of return on investment. So, uh, just to stick to that point, I think it's a, it's a sticky point, you know, and uh, it's a concern. Maybe it's a very big concern with most of the service providers out here. You know, uh, I understand that we all talk about e-commerce being a complex uh, you know, environment. Let's just you know, keep the e-commerce on the side. Don't you see transformations and disruption requirements, you know, both in terms of technology, infrastructure, process, skills of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even in the in the in the B2B or in, uh, in in all the other sectors apart from e-commerce, you know, just to put it very simply. Just B2B or B2C as well. Even B2B and B2C, I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. not a brick of water, you know, in the brick if, you, if you can end up with drone deliveries mm -hmm. being allowed and you take out the human element in terms of where you've got to go and have the human involved in the last mile, then absolutely, that's a disruptor. Um, multiple drone deliveries at six o'clock in the morning, just dropping it into a special box in your garden, you wake up and it's there, <laughs> then your last mile is fulfilled. And, and a drone could probably do 10 or 20 deliveries before eight o'clock. 
he can start delivering, did I say he? It, sorry. Um, we'll start, can start delivering from one to o'clock onwards if they're silent. So the, the, one of the biggest challenges we have in, in logistics is, is actually having the goods arrive cleared and ready for delivery, having the paperwork ready if it's cash on delivery, um, duties, etc. VAT now has to be paid for. Do clients now have to have a salic like account where they give you 5,000 dirhams in credit that you can automatically deduct as you do the deliveries? That would speed up the process. But not many people in this room are going, are going to have somebody uh, have that uh, ability to draw down of, uh, of a credit account. Indeed, in our business, we're expected by most of our customers to actually put up the duty for them on arrival. Well, we have a two to three million dirham duty deposit in customs, whereby for two, three, four days, we can be out of pocket hundreds of thousands of dollars for a $10,000 shipment, for example. Okay, so do you see opportunities in this area? I mean, do you see this changing and therefore looking at it as an opportunity? Or do you see this is just going to remain the same? It's not, nothing's going to change. No, it will, definitely, it will definitely change in terms of uh, observing last mile, for example, in income. We will very much take a, a, an observer's point of view, but our, our owner, Emirates Group, is actually moving through Skycar going into that space. But I feel that I don't have enough information about it, but I think they'll probably use the parties for that. Uh, okay. uh, let's keep the e-commerce down on the side, and let's come back to you know the normal general cargo distribution that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis and that's what overall most of this economy is about. Okay. Uh, where do you see transformation and opportunities? Are you seeing people uh, demanding technology, automation? Uh, where do you see this demand actually growing? In which side of the infrastructure and operations and process do you see uh, demand changing? Basically what we have noticed is everyone is looking at what they spend at the end of the day. So today I noticed like with the transport, everyone looks at what a freelancer is giving per trip, say within Jabdali or Jabdali to Dubai. And companies like us have to benchmark to a similar price at the same time maintain a level of service, GPS, etc. etc. So Technology is important, as I mentioned, like for example, with transportation, small time companies can look at investing with GPS where they can track their truck. Versus the pricing is, doesn't go exorbitant. You can still maintain a low price, you can still compete with a logistics provider or a transport provider who's only doing pickup or trailer trucks. <coughs> when it comes to warehousing, I feel it's good to be honest to the customer. For example, we had an inquiry wherein the customer requested us to put for him 10,000 square meters of warehousing space for him to come up with a solution for spare parts. Putting technology that is the WMS, the racking solutions, and the resource that we had, we provided the customer a solution in 6,000 square meters. This helped us gain confidence with the customer. <coughs> we worked with him for six years. Until such time, he felt he could build a warehouse of his own and got us provide him a solution of running his warehouse. So technology helps. At the same time, transparency with the customer when he notices where his dirham is spent is also important. So to conclude, I think there is still a lot of opportunity for PPLs, small timers like us, wherein we are a 100% MRI company with, with capital that is generated within the UAE and spent within the UAE. It is a hope that you can do well. I mean, we are in a mode where there is the recession mode, but at the same time, we are in a mode where business is improving for us. Okay. James, um, what do you see as the key trends in industrial markets you know, um, that are evolving? 
Uh, I want you to focus on you know, the changing customer needs and uh, if you can spend a little time on cost benefit analysis. Okay, uh, key trends uh, we're seeing in the market, obviously we've talked about uh, an element of price correction, we've talked about a little bit of oversupply. Um, other trends we're seeing in the current market include uh, build to suit solutions, uh, particularly for um, larger ticket requirements, for perhaps for e commerce or perhaps for specialist use. Um, that's something that we're seeing that has happened in the last uh, few years and probably will continue to happen um, over, over the next few years. Um, the lights all the likes of the uh, of RMX, the likes of uh, Palantina, the likes of uh, <coughs> our group have all delivered build to suit cardboard develop, develop, uh, build to suit last year. Uh, and that, that just reflects uh, larger ticket requirements not having an available or suitable space um, in, in, the current, in the current market. I think e commerce, keep coming back to e commerce, e commerce is a key player and will continue to be a player here in Dubai and the wider. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia and probably, probably Egypt being a key target area um, over the next few years, uh, and, and they'll probably go down a, a build to suit route as well. Um, in, in terms of other key trends, um, just bringing it back around to real estate again, um, we're seeing an, a, an investor appetite in, um, in industrial logistics assets. We're seeing for almost perhaps the first time here in, in, in Dubai and at least we're seeing institutional funds and, um, and, and the new, new government REIT uh, targeting industrial assets, particularly um, well-built, well-specified units, particularly with um, e-commerce or, or high-end uh, blue chip uh, covenants. Uh, and we're seeing those, those type of, types of assets coming to the market and, and funds looking at those types of assets. Um, so that's maybe, that's maybe the, a few of the key trends. Um, you mentioned cost benefit analysis. I think uh, I think I think that's a whole topic in itself. Um, in the current market conditions, we're seeing a lot of people move uh, one warehouse to another warehouse just to save on cost. That's, that's just a that's just a cost benefit save um, on a on on, on a, 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 that people are looking to do. Um, I think I think again, there's quite a quality and a two tiered approach there that somebody might. Uh, for the same amount of money, move to a better caliber warehouse, or somebody might move for a, to save themselves 10, 10% or 20% of the cost, might move to a, a poor quality warehouse. So there, there's options there on, 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 the, on that cost benefit analysis play. Sean, can I ask you a question, you know, that since you are a service provider, <coughs> uh, do you see, uh, you know, overall change, you know, in global standardization or other global standard facilities? Uh, do you see uh, standardization becoming uh, more of uh, uh, more, more in demand, or and you see change of facilities that would take place in this industry, or you feel that uh, it's pretty much quite standard? I think I think in certain uh, in certain sectors there will be a required standard that will have to be achieved, and regulation in our business I think is lacking in a lot of areas. Um, a little bit if you compare to the recent uh, customs accreditation that they've rolled out around the world now with the AEO concept, the Proof Economic Operator. Um, if you have a, a similar standard everywhere, then th there's a given in the industry which will, will benefit, I think, both uh, owners of those businesses and, and clients. Um, I think that also again with the way that the world is working everything is becoming smaller and smaller if you go back to the beginning uh, in the 60s when the courier industry first started there is no warehousing you send it from point a and it's delivered without going through a warehouse um, in the e-commerce industry i see a lot more of that coming in the future whereby there is no warehouse okay but my question was with respect to the warehouse buildings. Yeah. I think the buildings, uh, in, in terms of sustainability, uh, in terms of the green concept, everybody is looking at. If you are in, in the in the um, in the place right now, as we are looking at uh, to build a new facility, 
Um, the conversations that you have are nothing like they would have been five years ago even. So green build, uh, solar panels on the roof, um, solar windows so you can have natural light in your facility whereas before you couldn't because the development of certain materials is getting better and better for the build. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we started a little late so I'll have to you know, slowly crunch on, on time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for all the insights that each of you has uh, given here. I uh, would like to open up uh, the house for questions, if there are any. Questions, please. Great. So, uh, let's, let's move ahead. I think uh, some of the very interesting points, you know, that you all mentioned uh, were related to uh, the very basic requirement of standardization in the entire industry and as far as buildings are concerned. Uh, the, uh, the interesting point that you raised in terms of overall demand and supply, uh, and you clearly see that you know, there, is, there is a huge amount of flexibility that's required in terms of human demand. Uh, I think the point that Jamal uh, raised was the fact that he wants not only flexibility, but he also wants scalability and skills that needs to be imparted. Uh, thank you very much for all the points that you uh, mentioned. Uh, can we give them a round of applause, please? Thank you.